So the Ruby production team is on hiatus until February what was it, 12th. So I figured now, considering they're probably still working on volume eight and moving on to volume nine, this might be a good chance to get my foot in the door. Cause uh, I've got an idea for something to add to the plot and something to add to the storyline, to add to the lore. And if you like what you see here, go ahead and share it. Uh, hopefully, especially possibly to the writers of the show. Now, if you are the writers of the show and you're watching, Hi, Miles, Carrie, how you guys doing? Uh, just so you know, this is Creative Commons. This is no copyright, no nonsense. Just go for it. You like what you see, you take it. You don't like what you see, leave it, you know? Put it that way. But uh, I had a few ideas for adding to the lore of the story, explaining and rationalizing a thing or two. And this becomes sort of its own storyline. And, well, it's a modular one. There was a previous attempt I made. This was back when the uh, when the forums were still up, and dear God, don't. Mm -mm. Those of you in the audience who remember, don't talk, okay? Because the previous version was so poorly written, it is an embarrassment. So this is a new attempt, a fresh attempt. There's some little bits and pieces salvaged here and there from the old attempt because that had, you know, one or two good things, nice aesthetics here and there, but. We're gonna roll with it. Now this, this is not just, you know, fan thick. I guess this is an actual proposal. This is an option that you can take or leave, whatever you want. And, well, it's modular. I'll put it that way. You can use what you want and leave out what you don't. But the version of the story I'm gonna tell, well, I mean, yeah, the, the fans have not been shutting up about it. Now, I get it. I get that there's been multiple attempts in the way that previous volumes have been written and all the things in the episode, you know, Jean melting down Pyrrha's weapons and everything and putting them onto his shield, the statue in Argus, the, you know, the meeting with Pyrrha's mom and, like, trying to be definitive, like, they're dead, they're not coming back. I get that. But at the same time, those flowers her mom was holding are connected, or at least if I've heard correctly, or if people aren't just bullshitting. But apparently those flowers are connected to resurrection and the afterlife, and there is an alternate ending that I think was written by the original author of the story of Achilles, where Achilles' mom pulls him off the funeral pyre, resuscitates him, and leads him to a more peaceful life. I mean, you could leave out the last bit of that but if you want to, but is there still an option, right? And so, the lore I was thinking of expanding on here, this is going to be something where it splits off into multiple directions. You have an arc of the story in Vale, episode maybe two, a little bit in Mistral, possibly one, maybe two episodes, and then scattered in those same episodes, the uh, hell, if you will, the hellscape, uh, the grim realm, if you will, that has some connection. I'm also doing the editing, so if you see this, it means I'm interjecting because it got too rambly. And yes, I am dressed for doing the recording for basically episode two of this little series. Gonna be, mm, let's see, there's first video, then there's, so four, maybe five episodes? Just a heads up, and if I interject, it means I got too rambly or shared too much. So if something seems a little under fleshed out or underdeveloped, it's probably gonna be discussed in the next couple of episodes. But if you like what you see, or you have any feedback, you know where to post it. Doors always open, come right on in. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Yes, I have a bird. He's a recurring guest on this channel, whether I like it or not. So the storyline here, I mean, again, I'm using this version with this character in here. You know, we're gonna include Pyrrha in this because this does have an interesting connection. I find that to be the most compelling version, but you don't have to. If you want to substitute in perhaps a Persephone character and bait the audience a little and sort of mess with them, you could do that. I wouldn't advise it, but then again, I'm not the one writing the show. So, the arrow Cinder shot Pyrrha with, here's the idea, has a Grim embedded in it. It is essentially a Grim parasite, and so the idea is with that torturous duration of time, you know, Cinder shoots her and just lets the arrow kind of simmer in there. That's the grim spore, if you will, cracking open and biting in, really biting into the host. So basically what it means is if there's a grim embedded in that arrow and it's bitten in, that becomes the transfer mechanism. The idea is you kill the character, you actually genuinely have like intent to kill, you take him down and it sends them back to 
basically hell, right? So the idea here in this storyline is Ruby interrupted that process. It's a very rare instance to try doing this. And, well, it's even rarer for Silver Eye Warrior to get in the way of that, which makes it a very interesting and viable option for the storyline. Just something interesting. So we see this character growth by seeing the soul sort of put on the chopping block and taken apart and leading essentially two separate lives. One living in basically hell, the other surviving with the help of others, basically in the aftermath of, well, the Battle of Beacon. So I think that's going to provide a really interesting and viable story path because where we start off with is you see the character torn apart and we see one side basically going into hell, having to go through all that and learning to become stronger and not be like spiteful and hateful and resentful of everything, learning to find the silver lining in life. And the other side, finding ways to help, finding other ways to be a hero. And those two feed into each other. So the idea is you take this opponent of yours, you kill them, bring them back to your realm, and you let that parasite consume and overtake them. So the idea of this grim is you basically create sort of this grim zombie. You have the shell of who the person used to be, but not only does it look like a grim, which is already kind of scary enough, but there's no, there's no soul of the original character left once the process is done. And but, you, know, you have to finish the process, basically, and this is sort of where some, uh, or perhaps there's room in the story for to explain for all this time, you basically have to break this character down that you've infested with this parasite. You have to break them down mentally, emotionally, and physically. You have to break them physically so that their aura goes down and the Grim is allowed to spread without being blocked. You have to break them emotionally, that creates despair. Grim feed on negative emotions, right? Remember that from... It, some of you probably do, and breaking them down mentally, finding the things that stress them out the most, gives the Grim something to sort of take note of. And basically, once the process is done, by the time that Grim reaches the brain, it can start causing a tremendous number of issues, which leads to a sort of cascade failure. Essentially, they might have muscle convulsions if one part of the brain gets breached, like the brain stem. They might have irregular heartbeats, which freak them out, which feeds the grim, which causes it to latch on and do more, which keeps going. If it gets into a sort of visual cortex, they might have hallucinations, nightmarish hallucinations, which freak them out, which again leads to a cascade failure. Or certain other parts of the brain, like those like that control sort of if you ever think to yourself or sort of talk to yourself in your own head, you can sort of hear yourself talking without actually speaking. That can be a way in as well. It can start casting doubt on the host. It can start freaking them out and just get through to them that way. But whatever it is, if it breaches the brain, you're done. And at that point, it can eat the entire host's soul and possibly still retain sort of their semblance, or maybe it keeps a fragment of their soul alive to keep that semblance working. But at that point, there is no recovery. You send that character back out against their friend, they are going to be just a, a psychological weapon at that point. There is no breaking through to them. There is only killing and stopping them. And that's the route that some people have proposed going down and having Jean do that. But I don't know if that's such a great idea. You know, I, Looking back at what happened after Volume 3, I remember there were stories. Well, there were people who sent you know, cookies with razors in them after they killed Pierre off because people were so upset with how, how it was handled. I, I don't think people are going to be happy if the character is brought back just to be killed again. Salem did not command Cinder to do this. Cinder just kind of brought those arrows along anyway. But I'll get to that in just a sec. The idea is Ruby going off, Ruby just blasting off and screaming at the end, that cut off the transfer window, that cut off the transfer overall. And the result of that is that most of Pyrrha in this storyline, or if it's, let's say, a Persephone character or somebody else who goes to hell or ends up in sort of this underworld, uh, they're sent across in their own way, whatever that may be. But with the Pyrrha storyline, most of her, maybe 60-70% of her, goes through, and the remaining 30-40%, to whatever is left behind in Vale, sort of wakes back up just a little bit and it sort of has this knee-jerk reaction to try to go back to the tower. You know, she's worried about her friend. And what you see is a really interesting sort of split in cognitions, in 
in memory and personality. The part that ends up being in basically hell, I'll just call the grim underworld basically hell, just to make it easier. Uh, the part that ends up in hell doesn't remember Beacon that well, interestingly enough. Doesn't remember her friends consciously. Uh, subconsciously, yes, there's a response. There's you know certain names, like they, they ring a bell, but it's not. it doesn't quite click. Something's not there. And if you put her in a room, you put this part of Pyrrha in a room with her team, she'd like she'd have an emotional response. She'd recognize them, but her memory's just not there. So it would be a very painful experience and that you know, that could still work. But the other part that remains in Vale has this knee-jerk reaction to go back and check on Ruby. And so we see this sort of in a in like a flashback later on in the way that this story is told later on. Uh, basically, you see sort of this sepia tone view of Pyrrha's soul. Like you see that it's kind of fragmented. Think uh, Anakin Skywalker on Mustafar kind of, you know, burning up, parted, you know, just not the whole thing. You see like a fragment, this flaming fragment fighting against the wind, you know, because the, the ashes are being blown away by the breeze at that high altitude. So it's just fighting tooth and nail to get back to Ruby to see if she's okay. Crow shows up, and the last thing that part of Pyrrha sees before blacking out and passing out until further intervention occurs is Crow, you know, standing there like, oh shit, I, what can I do? And you see that be really sort of demoralizing. And so that part of Pyrrha kicks herself constantly, just, just has that anxiety and that stress of thinking oh shit i just got my friend killed so of course we know that's not true she doesn't know that and you end up with the part sort of sort of in hell being like this this younger version that's not quite up to date on everything that's happened in the story so you see that part of her sort of woken back up in hell tortured a little you know, cinders trying to like break through be like why don't you remember stop lying to me you you know what happened and you see this part of Pyrrha like break down and cry for her mom and that's that's when everyone gets kind of freaked out that's when they start to realize the transfer wasn't complete and we start to figure out oh okay it was the silver eye girl you know the number of events of this kind of transfer have been sporadic historically I guess that could be part of the lore, that it's very sporadic. It's very rare to use those type of grim, and it's very rare, even in those situations, among those situations, it's rare to see a Silver Eye warrior get involved. So it's like nobody knew this was going to happen, not even Salem, because it's like, when does anyone fucking do this? But in this case, it's possible Cinder took some initiative to try and capture Ozpin and bring him back. But this was not necessarily her decision entirely. And this is where we get to the other part of the lore, the Grim in her arm. And yes, I know, it, it looks like, it's like it's like I'm practically holding up a sheet of paper. I know, I, I need to go outside and walk. But <laughs> Sorry, but it's a, it's a Grim in her arm. The idea here is we expand on that as sort of this half character, if you will, this Grim sort of, connects with her on a psychological level. Initially, it was intended as a sort of symbiote to continually motivate her to keep on going, keep on doing what she was tasked with doing, which was death, destruction, and carnage. Because that's a grim feed on, right? Negative emotions, that's in the lore. So the way this grim achieves that, the way that it can feed itself and enjoy itself, is constantly poking and prodding Cinder to motivate her to do this or do that. And this is where you see it suggesting bringing those grim arrows or bringing those grim that can be packed into arrows and used. This is where you see it at the end of the fight between uh, Cinder and Pyrrha, it gets involved and it says something along the lines of, oh, this little morsel could be quite useful. Just imagine a, an, an obedient dog, a servant to you for the end of time, fit for a queen. You see that sort of dialogue go on, and you see there's sort of this exchange back and forth. Cinder's like, I don't get the point of doing this, and the Grimm's like, trust me, do it, do it. And you hear Pyrrha talk about destiny, and Cinder's like, ah, maybe this was destined. 
So it's a, it's, it's a little slip up because that grim is actually really kind of stupid. And it's not really itself talking. It's an amplifier more than anything for the things in Cinder's subconscious. The idea is that it takes her sort of desires, her goals, and knows how to use that to manipulate her. Think of it like a like that manipulative ex-boyfriend that everyone seems to talk about. Uh, basically, that thing that Grimm can keep messing with her, and as it grows out of control, it, be it tries to become more and more of this dominant voice. And it has sort of this back and forth where if Cinder tries to refuse to follow its orders, it gets a little more toxic, it gets a little more aggressive, and just wears her down like it is trying to gorge itself on negative emotions it's trying to grow stronger and stronger and it can do that in one of two ways one it can torment the host or two it can get the host to go torment someone else which is where you see the motivation for cinder to occasionally go back to her little side project her little extracurricular activity which is pyrrha or perhaps a persephone character if that's the storyline you go down and this this storyline could kind of delve into that and could delve into the changes in her decision making and things that people have used as reasons to call her a trash villain you know i'm not trying to be mean i know miles listen i know you've already talked about it a lot on twitter you don't want to reward people for being assholes i'm just don't shoot the messenger okay J just saying you know i think this could help the odds of the writers of the show actually trying this i guess that depends on the fan reaction so again Anyone who wants to share this, animate this, do whatever with it, take it and run wild. Let's spread the word. Let's get this out there. You know, if you like the idea, again, help me promote it. Anyway, this stupid ass Grim keeps pushing her like an abusive boyfriend, weaseling its way back in again and again, just getting into her head and sort of coaxing her, pushing her to do these things that put her in trouble because it wins either way. If she gets severely hurt, it gets more to consume, right? There's no defense, there's no more barrier, it can continue to consume. And it can sort of sustain itself, gorge itself, on making her feel like shit. But, if it can motivate the host correctly, if it can motivate Cinder correctly, she'll go after someone else and torment them, and hurt them, and the Grim wins either way. So that could explain why, like for example, what was it, Volume 4, was it, where they uh, opened volume four volume five where they opened the vault and they found Jin. well think about it she was told not to go out there not to go after ruby not to go after these kids because it was just going to end badly again what motivated her to go out and do that a hunger for power and possibly enough tormenting in her head to make her just break and go okay fine we'll do this we'll go try this out and that sort of teasing, that antagonizing in the back of her head will continue to motivate her to do more of these things. Where it goes from here is you have those different storylines, like I said. Basically Hell, Vale, and Mistral. You see those background stories taking place. So the Vale arc would revolve a bit more around this sort of Tesla character. There was a, there was a project that Tesla worked on called Wardenclyffe Tower. It's been the subject of multiple conspiracy theories, but I'll completely just leapfrog that. So in the show, we already know satellites can't get to orbit because dust-based engines are just not capable at that altitude. Dust just gives up. The original idea behind Wardenclyffe Tower, it was marketed as a communication system, but demonstrated as a power transmitter, a wireless power system. And that's where the conspiracy theories start, but to make it a shorter story, Tesla did not think that planes of his time were efficient enough or powerful enough to fly very effectively. So, his idea was to have an electric plane with no batteries, and you generate all the energy you need on the ground and transmit that up to the plane in flight. So in this storyline for Ruby, we've got a space plane. And this does also connect in a few other ways, but that will be explained in a subsequent video on the Veil arc, which is probably the next video I'll do. So the idea that we have here is that this Tesla character, when he was younger, was involved directly in the development or modernization, whichever one the writers choose, of the cross-continental tower system. And so the idea he had was to create a layer of ionic charge in the atmosphere that wraps around the planet and these towers can pick up signals from it and emit pulses to it. Essentially, you poke the membrane and let the ripples 
carry the information you need. So this is a very inefficient way to communicate, but if someday you do want to put satellites into orbit, you could have a space plane go up and just emit satellites as, as it flies near the edge of the atmosphere. And you have a new propulsion system that would rely on dust power from the ground being beamed up to the space plane to run a new type of engine. In the Mistral story arc, we follow this sort of Tom Sawyer character and his run-ins with essentially the Big Bad Wolf, which sort of doubles as Injun Joe from the original Tom Sawyer storyline. This Big Bad Wolf character, this Injun Joe type, sort of a homeless mobster, if you will, going around marauding, doing whatever he wants, is being sort of co-opted by the main villains. And combined with Cinder's sort of eh, lackluster performance, She's tasked with getting some practice in Mistral, helping to establish this new mobster character, this very dangerous brute to instill chaos and fear, while the operations from Salem's side are focused more on Atlas, or going to be focused more on Atlas. Just instill chaos everywhere you go. That's the major plan. And we see that this Tom Sawyer character and his friends, they bust them. They bust the two. They bust Cinder and the Big Bad Wolf who've basically lured the local crime bosses into meeting up at a warehouse. Tom Sawyer's girlfriend in the story, her dad is a judge, and here's what I'm thinking, that could be a sort of three little pig situation. You have a judge, a cop, and you know, maybe a confidential informant. You have the three of them, right? House made of straw, house made of sticks, house made of brick, right? So the first two, dead, right? The confidential informant, that's the character Injun Joe kills in uh, basically the early Tom Sawyer storyline, looking for some sort of loot, looking for some sort of valuables. The second one, that would be more like a like a trailer or just a, a recent incident after this big bad wolf character, after this Injun Joe character gets out of jail. The kids have gone to the warehouse, they've busted the operation, they've got this big bad wolf on camera, they've got evidence on camera, and they get hurt pretty bad trying to run away from the warehouse. They get busted. So they run. Now it's personal. And now the judge's life is at risk. So that's an interesting sort of compelling, more adventurous storyline. And then with that grim arc, we see this tale of a character who is fragmented, who is hurt pretty bad, who's not holding together too well. But there is an interesting thing about that. Uh, the two parts of Pyrrha's soul that are left behind, if that's the storyline we go down. If not, you know, if you don't want to go down that route, it could be someone else. It could be a Persephone character, if you will. That's possible. But if we're going with the Pyrrha storyline, the two parts of her soul, the smaller part left behind in Vale on the tower, and the part in basically Hell, still have a sort of connection to each other sort of bridged through a different spatial dimension, which explains how Grimm are able to evaporate and transfer back home so quickly and then make it back into the world just as quickly. So that they're picking a different dimensional path, right? Like that famous example of a wormhole, you have a sheet of paper, you poke a hole through from one side to the other. You're using an external dimension to make the trip shorter, taking a shortcut. Same idea applies here. And they're linked through that. The part of her soul in Veil can see what's going on with the part of her soul that's in basically hell, but not really the other way around. The other way around, it's just auditory. And you see that sort of Pyrrha's memories are split between the two personalities, and the part in hell at, at first doesn't really remember Beacon, doesn't remember her friends very well. She's, she'd still have an emotional connection to seeing like images of them or hearing about them, because there's something subconsciously there, but consciously, she doesn't remember what happened. And on the other side, the part in Vale has trouble remembering her childhood, has trouble remembering her name, has trouble remembering certain things that happened before Beacon, and there are other memories that are lost along the way. And we see sort of this Hanoi Hilton kind of treatment in Hell. We see that she's getting you know beaten up to break her defenses and let that grim start to fester, because you have the arrow go in, and that explains the torture scene. By extending the duration of that torture, you allow that Grimm to bite in. You allow it to take hold and spread and fester a little more. So what we see is this 
part of her that's in hell just getting broken and still eventually holding on to some extent, or mostly, just even with these major aesthetic changes that happen and the rate of progression, the total progression overall becomes kind of astounding, just spoilers. But what really sticks out in this situation is the resilience that's built up, this character development, you know, learning to find the silver lining in things. You see that growth of their character arc. You see them being demoralized in hell, but the part that's not being helped and possibly remoralized, being helped and bolstered in certain ways as sort of emotional support. There's this back and forth connection and one finds strength in the other and a little bit vice versa. So if you like what you see here, help me promote it, help me get this out there, maybe even possibly send this to the people who've written the show. If any of you want to animate this or have any ideas about how to build up the characters and their backstories more or anything or anything you want to contribute, any advice, any input, that'd be greatly appreciated. <clears throat> and, uh, well, yeah, I hope you enjoy. I'll try and get these videos out. School for me starts basically four days before the hiatus ends, so I've got to get through this, you know, pretty quick. i got to get to it. So I'll try to do that. I spent most of the time working on the visuals, refining the story, and actually like trying this time to write things effectively. So yeah, hope you enjoy. Stick around if you want me to talk a little bit more, but otherwise, out to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit. You know, for those of you who remember the original storyline, it was it was just Deus Ex bullshit. You know, Deus Ex Machina is because. It because I uh, because fuck it basically that's the way it was just written as because fuck it and part of that is because my only writing experience and this was like three four years ago when I when I was in high school yep. but this time I hope people enjoy it more I hope people can resonate with it more because there's more sensibility to it. I've, over all these years, I've, I've seen more and learned more about you know, continuity and sensibility, thinking about the inner workings of things. And I want to really apply that here. The fact that I've lost sleep over this is actually kind of stupid because I haven't even like watched the show in a while. But I, you know, it's that nostalgic thing. It, you know, it's wanting them to do well. It's wanting the story to do well, wanting the company to do well, just wanting to help. Right. You know, a lot of people are saying they don't want Pyrrha brought back on the show, nor do they want Roman Torchwick brought back on the show, because they don't have much confidence in the writers to do that effectively. And the way I see it, it's like it, there's people leaving the show because it's like they keep slamming nails into the coffin for Pyrrha, and there's like hints that Roman might be coming back. There's hints that, Pe well, Penny's already back. You can see that. But then with Pyrrha, people were unsatisfied with that character ending. It hurt them It hurt them more than the writers perhaps would have realized, because Pyrrha's kind of that character where it's like a person that you know. It's like one of my subscribers, someone else from the forums, hey Marissa, hope you're doing good. And that's who. Uh, Pyrrha reminded her of her sister, so that, that was personal for her. For me, it was basically my dating life in high school. Like, it wasn't even any dating involved, and it was still crash and burn dumpster fire shit and it just draws way too many parallels with the story it's like I, I i'll go on about that some other time but people took it very personally and so people are highly unsatisfied that this is how the story is being left off for the people who were interested in seeing her come back who are still holding out still trying to like say hey this there's a possibility here this is why i'm putting this out here this is from somebody who understands the sensitivity, the gravity of the situation on a personal level. And I've learned how to write stories better. I've learned how to be better about making characters and making things sensible from a plot perspective. Hopefully this story attempt, or this proposal, goes a lot better than the previous version. And, well, that's basically all I've got to say for now. I'll see you guys in the next couple of videos. I'll try to get this out maybe on a five-day schedule and do things. Don't mind them. But yeah, thanks for watching. And again, please, if you can, help me promote this.